we always need to stay up because the technology is always changing. Business of Architecture, episode 371. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And this week I'm speaking with architecture firm IT specialist, Boris Rappaport. Now, Boris has had over 20 years experience helping architectural design and engineering firms make their businesses more efficient and profitable with the use of technology. He is the founder of the IT support firm Arkit, who exclusively serve architectural practices, design firms and engineering firms, and helps them utilize and protect their businesses using IT. He basically operates like a external support IT system. It's quite an incredible array of services that they provide. And in this episode, we explore some of the common IT and tech mistakes that architectural firms commonly make, the vulnerabilities that practices and businesses will face to their operational efficiencies, and how to create a powerful IT system to have your business working smoothly. So sit back, relax and enjoy Boris Rappaport. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Boris, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? Hey, thank you. Thank you for having me, Ryan. Um, I'm, I'm doing good. Um, it's, it's a nice morning here where I am and, um, you know, I'm ready to go. Excellent. Good, 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 good. Now, you are... How would you describe your expertise? You're an IT engineer. You, you've specialized working with architecture firms, uh, providing lots of different types of uh, innovative memory storage solutions. And how, how, would you, how would you describe your role? Well, um, so I'm a technology success partner for architects, Great. right? And um, here at Arc IT, what we try to do is make sure that architects realize that technology can be a competitive advantage for them. Um, and it's not just, you know, a lot of people, a lot of architects think of technology as, you know, what kind of design tool do we use or something to that effect. But that's just kind of the tip of the pyramid. Um, mm -hmm. It goes deeper down into your whole operations of the firm, right? Because as you implement new technologies, you need a way to integrate them together mm -hmm. um, as part of your strategy and technology stack. And you also need to manage that to make sure that you're always running as efficiently as possible. So uh, this is the kind of services that we provide. And this is what I want to, um, you know, this is why I started my firm is to provide that type of solutions to our clients. Got it. And, and what, what had you focus in on the, the architecture industry? What are, we um, doing, what are we doing wrong with our, with our IT? <laughs> Well, it's not just IT, it's, I think it's the technology adoption in general is very slow. Um, I, I'm just being honest, like this is no, what we see across our client base. We're not <laughs> um, But I think like, as I look at it full circle um, and kind of looking back at my childhood, um, it kind of came full circle where, uh, my, so my dad, um, he was a mechanical engineer. And so he did a lot of drafting and we are from the old USSR, so he did a lot of it by hand, right? right. Back back in, um, you know, it was like the 80s. Um, and I was just sitting there and like watching him work and that was kind of fascinating. Um, and I wanted to be um, kind of, I, you know, I always from the young kind of age strived for that as well. Like I would draw stuff and I wasn't very good at it. So um, <laughs> I think what happened next is when we migrated here, so my dad has to, had to start learning AutoCAD um, so right. he could work. And, you know, all our savings that we brought over, he spent on this one computer. Uh, it was wow. a powerful machine back then, uh, but basically it was like $6,000. And then he yeah. had to pay somebody else like $1,000 to come in and install CAD for him. Um, so at that point, we ran out of money. And I was actually helping him um, fix issues 
when I was like 15, 16, I was helping him fix issues because he couldn't fix it himself. So I kind of learned the tools as well at that time. And I mean, when I went to um, college, I basically wanted to be an architect, mm-hmm. knowing the tools and knowing, but um, like I said, I'm not, I wasn't very creative in that sense. Um, so te- technology boom took off and I kind of figured that I'd be better served, um, you know, being a technology person. Got it. Um, so that's kind of how my life went. And then um, I joined this consultancy doing IT services. And most of my clients also turned out to be architects. So I've been doing technology for architects for about 20 years now. Got it. Got it. And and what are the sorts of, I mean, it's really interesting because you're. I know you're an allied member of the AIA. So, you know, you you kind of work closely in partnership and you have a deep understanding of actually the difficulties that architecture firms experience with, yep. with finding their technology solutions. From your perspective, what are some of the, the, the kind of most common mistakes or the common problems that you see architecture firms having to deal with? And, and, and does that differ between scale of practice? Uh, yeah. So if we think of how the typical firm evolves, mm-hmm. right, and that's, that's true for any startup, um, but if we're focusing on architecture firms, it's basically a, you know, a owner who probably worked for a firm, right, and then he comes out and starts his own firm so he can be, um, you know, bring something new to the world, right? Mm-hmm. And provide a service um, to his clients, designing or building. Um, they, so when, when, when they start a business, they're bringing the tools that they've used previously at another firm. And they're kind of starting using the tools. As they, as they hire people in, they either find people with the same um, knowledge in terms of technology and skill set or other people suggest other tools as well. So what happens a lot is by the time there are five people, there's like 20 different tools that a firm has. They're only really using one and they're not using it to full advantage anyway. Um, so that becomes really a problem of managing and understanding where your spend is. I mean, a lot of times when we come in and what we do is um, when we first meet a client, we do a strategic assessment. Mm-hmm. Like we find all those kind of things where I'm like, have you used this before? And he's like, yeah, maybe a year ago. And they're spending, you know, $200 a month on it, $300 a month on it. Um, a lot of money gets uh, wasted there. So that's kind of one thing. Another is just, again, having a strategy, right? Coming up with an overall plan to where your technology um, and how your technology can um, help your business. So we see a lack of that initially in small firms. In larger firms, it exists. The bigger problem there is just managing the day-to-day, making sure that people, if they're experiencing issues, get the response um, that they need. And, uh, you know, uh, also figuring out kind of um, how to keep your people working at all times and as efficient as possible. Got it. So. That's quite interesting how you're saying like the early stages of an architecture practice or any startup, you'll often have five, six different people bringing in different tools. And then you've got a kind of fragmentation, if you like, of mm-hmm. technology uses. And actually, probably 80% of the time, you're just using one of these solutions. Um, and, then, and then it can get easily confused because there might be three or four different ways of doing something. So... So what you're, what you're saying is that you, you, how do you do this? Do you go into a practice and kind of help them do an audit where you kind of, you're looking to kind of consolidate tech? Yeah, so tech processes. This, correct. Um, at the start of our relationship, we would come in and do an audit. Uh, we look at all the systems that you have, right? Whether it's software, physical systems, anything in the cloud. Um, and we put together an IT roadmap, um, basically a, three-year roadmap um, where it's actionable, where we say, look, um, these few things um, have a lot of risk potential for you. So that could be security issues, that could be lack of backups and things like that. And we, you know, we provide recommendations for taking care of those. And then we'll look at the overall, as I mentioned, overall workflow and the processes and say, well, these four things probably can be eliminated unless you really, you know, have your heart set on them. And if you do, then we need to focus on those and make sure that you're getting the most out of those tools and eliminating something else because you don't need seven things to do 
uh, the same thing, right? So what's, what's so what's the difference then between, for example, having in, your kind of in-house IT or everyone everyone work, doing their own IT versus having kind of a managed IT solutions? What is what are the benefits to a practice? Well, so architects, no matter how technical they are, I think unless they want to be IT people, um, their you know their ability is to um, you know, design buildings and make thing, make beautiful things, right? So um, IT, um, you know, requires a certain level of expertise where um, I don't think people want to necessarily spend the time uh, to deal with it on a day-to-day basis, right? If you're an architect, you probably want to focus on um, doing what you love to do best and what you went to school for. Yeah. Um, so in a small firm where you can't really afford a really good IT person. I don't know um, what the salary ranges are uh, where you at, but you know, in where we at, it's you know, you have to pay sp- spend one hundred to one hundred twenty thousand to hire a good IT person, right, a year. Um, you know, so small. If if you're a firm of under thirty or under even under fifty people, you don't always are able to hire somebody like that. Um, also, when you do hire, it's only one person. Most of the time they spend is kind of running around um, fixing issues, right? Mm-hmm. They don't have time to stop and kind of think strategically. They don't have time to think proactively. Um, they just, you know, they're always fighting fire. So um, one of the benefits that we provide for like the single IT person is we help them with this strategic and proactive approach as well. But as a business owner, um, Again, you want to spend more, most of your time focused on your unique ability, which is um, either as an architect or as a business owner leading and managing people and yeah. not dealing with, you know, kind of basic things where you need to fix a printer or, uh, you know, one of your people is always asking questions about how to do something in CAD, like those things you don't want to deal with. Yeah. And um, well, this is one of the kind of the the growing pains, anyone who's experienced having worked in the luxury of a large corporate office and then starting your own practice that 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 simple phone call to the IT help department is removed and you can suddenly fall into the trap of spending half a day trying to fix your own computer and you know you know trying to figure out how to set the printers up and you know and again other things like backup and storage is is another constant concern and and worry um what are the sorts i mean obviously you've architects use a lot of specialist software tools which i would imagine lots of other startups don't use things like revit Uh autocad um other sorts of bim software how important is a working knowledge of those systems for for yourself or for any it expertise who you might be hiring into your architecture firm Uh, i would say it's very important right um that's you know that's the reason how we can provide fast and reliable service, right? So our goal is to fix your issue right then and there when you give us a phone call if it's an urgent issue. Mm -hmm. And um, the deeper we know the tools, right, uh, specifically around Autodesk tools, I I think we have a couple of guys that are really great at it. Um, And also, we also work with Archicad as well. Um, The easier it is for us to solve the problem. And it could be a problem that takes, you know, another IT company a day or two to just figure out, we can probably solve it within the hour. Um, or if we can't, then we have contacts um, at Autodesk and uh, Archicad that we can go to and try to get that as soon as possible as well. Many other IT companies can, um, and I've been working uh, for another one before, right? So I kind of know they're basically saying, look, uh, your professional software is off limits. Like we manage everything else, but if you have issues with your professional software, um, just call whatever, whoever the reseller is. And it just becomes an issue because it's like starts finger pointing and you as an architect in the middle of it, right? Because you have to call these people and then these people will say, well, why don't you call your IT provider and find out what they're doing? It, it just becomes a hustle. We the premise of our service is that we can take care of all those issues at one time for you. Got it. And, and what are the sorts of kind of emergencies that you see architecture firms having to deal with in with their <laughs> ITs? What are, the, what are some of the, 
what are the things that can be avoidable? Well, I think, especially right now, since we're working uh, from home, uh, cybersecurity needs to be a big focus. Right. Right. And many issues, um, at least like last year, we got two clients just because of those issues is that people got uh, some ransomware and their servers went down and their you know previous IT provider didn't re- couldn't get response to them in time. They were down for basically three, four days before they could even start recovering data. Um, so what, um, so what, those, what, what does that mean? That means somebody's actually hacked into the business and... Well, kind of. So hacked in is, um, I guess, yeah, it's a layman's term, but right. basically <laughs> somebody opened an email. Uh, the email had a link. They clicked on that link. Uh, um, some process ran in the background and their system, since this was their home system, it wasn't really protected that well. That's another thing. Like we protect all the home and office systems for our clients. Um, it wasn't that protected. It encrypted their machine and they were connected to the VPN. So it can encrypted the server in the office oh, cool. and whatever. They also had like a Google drive. Right. It synced all that up to. So it basically encrypted the whole company infrastructure within two hours. People could not access any of their project files anymore. <sighs> Oh, that's horrendous. Imagine that. So you're that's an architecture horrendous. firm. I can't, even, of, I can't even, even me palpitations just thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, you're an architecture firm of 15 people and you cannot access any of your projects. Right. right? And oh, everybody's working remotely. It's not like you can be in an office and maybe you have some paper drawings lying around that you can look at or whatever. I mean, mm-hmm. still probably, you know, you can only do 5 to 10% of work, but this is it. Um, so, yeah. And their IT provider was not responsive to them. Like I said, it took like three days and they finally, they called us in and we came in and hope, I'm glad they had decent backups. So we were mm-hmm. able to restore a lot of the stuff from backup. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if they didn't have the backups, um, which a lot of times companies don't, like they back up stuff, but they never try to restore from the backup to know that the backup's actually good. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was a fire drill. Uh, but, you know, I'm glad we got a good result and we got a good client out of it. So, so, so what sort of stage does a business need to be investing into IT management and having an IT roadmap? Is it something that you should be doing from day one as a, as a sole trader or is it, does it really become necessary when you've got a couple of members of staff? I'm, so... From my vantage point, I'm going to say day one, right? right. Uh, and as a business owner myself, and not just around technology. So basically, as a business owner, you always want to have a plan because when you start out, um, it's good to have the end in mind. So you can kind of, you need to know where you're going so you can build that journey, right? Mm-hmm. So for me, as I started out, I always knew that I wanted to, you know, to build a company that's going to be um, 10 million and plus in revenue. Right. And what that means, that means that, you know, I need to, it's going to be a bigger company. Um, I need to put the processes in place. Right. So even as I was one person, when I just initially started out four years ago, um, I was always thinking in those terms. So I think it always helps for business owners to think strategically in the terms of running a big company, even though you're one or two people. Yes. Um, Realistically though, what we see is the benefit for um, you know, for our services and kind of technology um, operations and implementations starts at about five, seven people. Like this is once you get to that size, the business owner has a lot of other things to do than to worry about your IT questions, right? Yeah. So yeah. Got it. Got it. And um, and it, it tell us a little bit about storage and backups. How how should architects be? backing up their work, how, how often should they be doing that? And, well, when, and when, when do problems arise? The real answer is back up as much as possible. Right. <laughs> so obviously not a realistic answer, right? Like backing up continuously would probably be the best, but um, that's obviously hard to achieve because it takes a lot of resources and a lot of storage and a lot of time. Mm-hmm. Now, the interesting challenge uh, with architects and the tools that um, – are used, for example, if you're using Autodesk uh, products like AutoCAD or Revit, 
you can't necessarily be putting all your stuff in the cloud, right? So if you're, you know, if you're a law firm, right, you can just, and you're running all the documents and the Word docs, you can use Google Drive. You can use OneDrive to store all your documents because that's a solved problem. For architects running models, um, it's not necessarily 100% solved. Now, there are solutions out there now um, that are doing that, um, but uh, they're also costly. So for example, like Revit has the BIM 360 platform, which is a great platform. If you run a firm of 40 people, it's 80 bucks a month per person. I mean, think of how much uh, money that is. So a lot of yeah. people prefer to still keep like a file server on premise uh, to store their Revit models on and work internally um, on those Revit models and not use the BIM 360 service. Only use the BIM 360 if owner requires it or um, there's a collaboration piece where you need to um, share the model with either engineers, um, you know, MEP, um, yeah. and as part of like construction uh, CA stuff, right? Um, so what happens is that internal file server um, needs to be backed up. We need to have a solution that basically is backing it up. We have, you know, we use a solution um, that backs it up locally and then sends it to the cloud so that we have a backup in two different places. So if ransomware hits, right, and then uh, for some reason the backup that we have on premise gets encrypted as well because some new ransomware does that, mm -hmm. uh, we still have a cloud copy that we can go to. Uh, and as backup management, we basically take take those backups, we test them um, every week to make sure that we can recover files from them so that we know that in case something bad happens, uh, we can restore. Got it. So in, in terms of, you know, what, what do you, what are your sorts of thoughts on practices that are, you know, using systems like Dropbox and that's their main way of, you know, all those other kinds of cloud-based storage systems and perhaps they've, they've got that and then that might be the only thing that they have. Is that secure enough or is that insufficient? Uh, so in that case, it depends on the level of service because you right. know, there's different tiering there. You want to make sure that you have a business um, level of service or you know, at least a business level of service. Some offer enterprise, which gives you more uh, security controls, mm -hmm. right? Uh, because the free service actually does not give you any protections. Um, right. And as long as they're using it and it works for their workflow, Mm -hmm. That's fine. I think many small practices are okay with doing um, with using the cloud is because they're not they don't have multiple people um, inside a single project. Um, so if it's one person, you know, one AutoCAD um, project or one Revit project, then it's not really a problem. The problem becomes when you're trying to collaborate, um, and actually the technology doesn't handle the cloud storage as well. Um, you run into conflicts. Um, there's there's issues that come up, like trying to, so if you have a, like a CAD drawing and three people from different places trying to open it in Dropbox, it basically creates three separate files, right? And those changes are not getting synced. So you run into conflicts. Um, so as long as one person is working on one project, it's fine. As you start multiple people, that's when you run into issues. Right, okay. So this it's is not just you... security, it's workflow as well. Got it. Okay. And this is where you need something a bit more sophisticated, like it's kind of the BIM 360 type of yep. elements where you can have numerous people working on the same model, essentially, or same parts of the, of the project. Correct. Got it. Um, tell me a little bit about your, your own business. You, you said that you, you guys have been going for four years and you've, how have you managed to, to scale up and, and how has the, the business been operating? Uh, very slowly. <laughs> so um, we currently have uh, five people. Yeah. Um, um, we have basically, uh, well, seven of you include contractors. Um, so we have five technical staff and two kind of business development marketing stuff. Um, you know, we've, we've started out like the first year was just myself. And, you know, I think we've, we've had growth uh, throughout the last four years, which is great. I, you know, like 80 to hundred percent growth year mm. over year, which is very exciting for me as a business owner. And I want to continue doing that and, you know, bring out 
more clients and help as many more people as I can, right? Because the goal here is um, to provide the service that no other IT company provides, um, to make sure that architects and engineers that we work with really experience technology for what it's supposed to be, not necessarily a headache that they think they, you know, they have on their hands. Because a lot of times when we come into a company, it will be like, well, we have a problem with this and we have a problem with that. And it shouldn't be that way. It's, it should be more of, we don't have any problems. How do we, you know, use these tools to make our business better? Right. Got it. Now, you you, would, you mentioned earlier about an IT roadmap mm-hmm. uh, and kind of being strategic. And often in the architecture world, businesses can you, you've got you know you've got the kind of the growth pattern where a business incrementally grows and perhaps it's a bit easier. Sometimes you know, like with lots of other types of businesses, there might be a sudden surge, like the winning of a bigger competition. You know, you've gone you've been doing lots of domestic residential projects. You know, there's been a small team, five, six of you, and then suddenly you win something on a commercial basis that now suddenly requires the team to treble or, you know, sometimes even more in size. So there's a sudden rapid piece of, of growth. Obviously, IT infrastructure at that point is going to be super crucial. H- how do you advise architecture firms to kind of plan or think ahead for that kind of, those kind of sudden b- bits of growth in infrastructure? Um, well, if so if we go back to kind of always have that mindset of thinking ahead, and I know, yeah. um, I know like you can win a competition and as you said, it's all of a sudden, right? But at that, at that point, you just have to stop, um, take a breath, right? And, and ask yourself, what does this actually mean for us, right? Does it mean, okay, we just got this new project or does it mean we're going to get 10 more projects just like this one we had? Does it mean we need to scale up staff? Okay, great. Um, we need to scale up staff. So we're going to hire five to 10 more people. Are they going to need to travel? Okay, great. They're going to need to travel. What am I going to do? How are they going to get all the services that they need to do their daily work if they travel? Right? So those are all the questions that um, we advise you should ask. Mm-hmm. And then we can work with you on a, on that strategic piece and we can ask those questions and find the answers. And then um, you know, propose solutions uh, to realize um, what you're trying to achieve as a business going forward. Got it. And 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 when you're putting together uh, an IT roadmap or kind of an IT strategic plan, um, and say that the growth is a lot more even killed, what sorts of how how do you help practices think long term? Well, so we have a questionnaire and a real. I mean, one of the meatier parts of that questionnaire is trying to understand the business and trying to understand the vision uh, for the business, right? And again, obviously things change, but I think um, looking ahead, as a business owner, you always have to be looking ahead, right? You have to look to the future and not the now and not the past. Um, so it, yes, it's like it's a mindset of a business owner, but the more we talk about it, hopefully the more um, people can understand that you always need to be looking ahead. So when we sit down and we kind of have our initial discussion, there's a bunch of questions that are um, specifically um, focus on that, right? We ask, you know, where do you see your firm in three years? Right. Um, how many people do you think are going to be working here? Um, do you going to stay in this office or, you know, you got to move somewhere else? Um, you know, what What projects are you going after? I know you're mostly small residential now, but are you planning to do any commercial work? Um, so all those questions we ask as part of our uh, assessment and evaluation. Got it. And I, I, I presume then obviously things like there are different security needs, if you like, for you when you're working on residential projects versus when you're working on commercial projects. Um, definitely, especially if you're working, if you're doing any like hospital work, um, if you're doing any government work, because right now, you know, in our um, neck of the woods, um, if you're doing any government work, or if you're working, you know, working with larger corporations, I don't know, like HPs, the Cisco's, and larger technology, Oracle, larger technology corporations, and designing their buildings, um, you have to go through a security audit, right? So they actually ask you um, 
to fill out a security audit before you can bid uh, for the job. So in that case, your yeah your security posture definitely needs to be on an up and up. Got it. Okay, so, so there are certain RFPs that you're not even going to be able to get get onto the frameworks unless you've got the the kind of credentials and security actually yep. already already working and up and in in place. Um, I, I'm very curious to to know a little bit about how how do you help companies keep abreast with evolving technology? So obviously, IT solutions are continually changing and up and upgrading, and it's not uncommon for a small practice to they start something eight years ago, and then they continually just do the same thing. Are we in a situation where we need to continuously be up to date with technology, or can or do things have kind of a long lifespan? Well. Um, I guess the answer here would be we always need to stay up because the technology is always changing. And mm-hmm. right now the rate of change is really, I mean, it went kind of, it was linear, 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 and then just kind of exponentially uh, blowing up right now. But it doesn't mean that we have to run after each new technology and kind of, oh, I'm going to try this or I'm going to try that. Again, having a solid strategy in place is, is kind of your number one priority and then base of that strategy, we need to figure out what the tools are. Because um, whatever is working, um, you know, for some firms may not necessarily be part of your workflow, right? Mm-hmm. It's not how you work and it's not working that well for you. you need, I think um, off of that strategy, you want to kind of have the parameters or understand the parameters of the tools that you need, right? Like what does this tool need to do for me? Which prob- what problem am, am I trying to solve? Right. Okay. Does this tool solve this problem? Fine. Does it solve the other problems that are kind of nice to have? Great. All right. So this is probably the tool we need to use. It shouldn't be, um, it shouldn't be like, Oh, everybody's using this tool. Let's see if we can stick it in our uh, process and see if it works. Um, it should be the other way around more planned. Um, so that type of approach, again, it's something that we work with our clients on and trying to understand their needs as opposed to just uh, what's around us. But um, that being said, we also, since we have, uh, we have various exposure to various sizes of firms, like some of the firms we work with are 100 to 200 people. Mm-hmm. And we also work with a lot of smaller firms as well. We're able to uh, look at what these larger firms are doing and what they've been successful with and kind of scale it down and bring it down to smaller firms where we can see that it's going to be beneficial. Um, like one of the things is uh, virtual reality, right? So a lot of our larger clients already have incorporated that into their design process um, where they do, you know, client presentations in virtual reality and they're having success with it. So we, you know, uh, we've kind of, we've talked to a few of our smaller firms about that as well. And we've actually implemented uh, one, you know, one of those implementations for our clients, smaller clients, and they're very happy with that. And, you know, now they can even see themselves, um, you know, being without it. Brilliant. And and when you do services with a practice or a firm, how does the relationship look like? Is it a kind of a one-off thing or is it a subscription or is it like a long-term relationship that you like to cultivate? So definitely we want to cultivate a long-term relationship. Um, And as far as our services go, uh, we work with our clients on a monthly subscription basis. Mm -hmm. So actually all our pricing is on our website and, um, you know, if anybody's interested, they can go and check it out. I'll give you the website later. Um, but we charge per user, um, on a monthly basis and we include a bunch of services as part of that. Um, you know, your standard kind of, uh, service desk, right? So if there's any issues, call us and we fix it. All the basic security stuff that we feel you need. So all the little tools like antivirus and, URL filtering to protect you from clicking on those links, um, email filtering, the more advanced kind, not the basic stuff that Google gives you. Um, right. So all of those things we include um, as part of that fee. And then um, as part of that, you also get the strategic guidance and advice we talked about. We basically meet with our customers either monthly or quarterly, depending on you know um, either size or rate of change or 
it, it's up to the business owner at that point, right? We're open to meeting monthly because I love having business conversations. Um, um, so yeah, and, and that's part of the service as well. Got it. Great. Brilliant. Is there, is there anything else that we should know? Um, I think we've covered a lot. So thank you uh, for this great conversation. Um, I mean, I really enjoyed it. Um, Perfect. I, I, I don't think like kind of going back through the interview, I think we've covered a lot of things and, you know, if there's any questions, um, your listeners can always go to uh, our website at get Arcit or get arcit.com. It's uh, G E T A R C H I T.com and um, click on uh, work with us button and fill out a quick questionnaire and uh, we can get in touch with them and answer any of their questions. Amazing. Boris, thank you so much for your, your time and your expertise and giving us the sort of the lowdown on the technical or how architecture practices can be technologically secure and safe. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. Um, and thank you to all the listeners and you have a great day. Cheers. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.